Uh, I will be talking about energetic dynamics of a rotating horizontal convection model with wind forcing, and I will go a little more into detail what that means. And I would also like to extend uh, my gratitude to the Blue Water System. This project has been funded uh, through my graduate fellowship uh, for the past two years. And it really would not have been possible without all that support. First, I will talk briefly um, what I'm going to be talking about. So I will first introduce you to the ocean circulation, uh, what it is, and what prior assumptions have been made about energy sources in the ocean. Uh, I will then talk about the important energy terms in the ocean, uh, mainly in kinetic energy and available potential energy, and how that's different from just good old regular potential energy, and then talk about the exchanges between kinetic and available potential energies. Then I will discuss my simulation setup and mainly what kind of surface forcings I have and why it was so important to run this on Blue Water's resources. And finally, show some of my results and uh, show what my future work is, is. And I'm sorry if you all are really tired of the Antarctic, but my work is going to be focused on this region called the Southern Ocean. and it's the region between Antarctica and all this landmass. So I know this talk this morning was mostly, a lot of it was about Antarctica, and hopefully, I'm not gonna be talking about terrestrial, it's gonna be all ocean, so hopefully it won't be too boring. Uh, this is one of the diagrams uh, of the thermohaline circulation. It's one of those conveyor belt kind of things that Al Gore talked about in his movie. You know, you have um, cold water basically being produced here due to cooling and sinking into, um, deeper under um, deeper water so and then that actually ends up resurfacing through these red um, in these red places as warmer water and so you know if you remember recall the movie if uh, s surface water is going to get warmer you know m we may be shutting down this conveyor belt and all these bad things happen but you know we don't really know what the system actually is and this is a very very simplified model of ocean circulation so why do we care about ocean circulation, all these sinking waters and whatever? Uh, in the ocean, in general, um, you have these two layers. So you have the top, very thin, mixed layer, and then you have this deep, uh, abyssal waters. And then in between, you have uh, this thing called pycnocline, which is a region where you have really high-density gradient. And it's really difficult to get water mixed across this high-density gradient. And why do we care about this mixing? So in the top layer, you in general tend to have more oxygen and more light penetration, but then all the nutrients tend to be concentrated in this abyssal region. So if you want to support any sort of uh, production, you really want to get these nutrients up and some of the oxygen down. Um, and in general, in the ocean, most flows are um, along surfaces of constant density. So you know, we really want to quantify how much of the mixing across the surfaces of constant density occurs. And if you think of the Arctic, uh, I'm sorry, of the Antarctic, you know, you have the tiny plankton that are being fed, uh, consumed by the fish, then goes to penguins, then goes to seals, and then they all end up sinking and decomposing into nutrients, which in turn then go back and feed um, the plankton. But, you know, it won't function if, for example, the mixing stopped. Uh, another important thing about mixing, uh, if you think about the carbon sinks in the ocean, so you know, if you just had the CO2 only being consumed in this mixed layer, it can actually go back into the atmosphere. So the carbon sinks that we traditionally do talk about is CO2 that ends up making it into this abyssal region, and that's where it's really hard to leave from. Uh, so. We want to, you know, and then if the mixing stops occurring across the pycnocline, then we won't be able to sink as much carbon dioxide, which is one of the issues in climate. Uh, so there are two existing uh, energy frameworks in ocean uh, circulation. So there's one that says, you know, in the mean circulation, you have this deep water formation. So you have the thermohaline circulation. You have uh, dense water forming at the poles, and then somewhere in the middle, in mid-latitudes, you have this upwelling from turbulent mixing due to winds and tides. And then you have another model <coughs> that says that in the mean circulation, you have water following all the isopycnals, so 
uh, levels of constant density, and it's wind-driven. And then um, it's balanced by all these tiny eddies that form in the surface that push um, water down back across the picnocline. But both of these models are only focused on wind and tides, and neither of them really look into differential heating and the um, heat flux forcings at the surface. Uh, and this is where the two energetics come in. So th those two models are basically only focused on kinetic energy. So if you think about your pendulum, uh, you know, you have the kinetic energy that's generated by moving water through winds and tides. But then on top of that, you have this available potential energy. So, you know, think of the pendulum kind of lifting up. Um, that's generated by buoyancy flux or heat flux through differential uh, heating or cooling and evaporation precipitation at the surface. And um, on top of that, one of the important things that I will focus on in this talk is this vertical buoyancy flux, so the exchange between kinetic energy and available potential energy. And it's positive if you're raising a dense fluid or lowering uh, light fluid, so you're creating more available potential energy. So that um, fluid parcel is going to have energy to rebound back to its natural state. And the vertical buoyancy flux is negative if you're lowering the dense fluid or raising of a light fluid. Uh, and this is a diagram of the energy cycle that I, in general, look at. And it's really busy. And we will be only focusing mainly on uh, these two terms, so the turbulence, so the um, time fluctuating component of the vertical buoyancy flux and the mean vertical buoyancy flux. And also we'll be focusing on the generation of available potential energy at the surface and how it results in this irreversible mixing. So this is the mixing across the um, lines of constant density. And I already have done some work on this ocean energy cycle based on the general circulation model outputs. And I will talk in a little bit more why it's important to uh, do this work on top of that. So, First, just a brief overview of what, what is AP and how it's different from just good old regular available poten uh, potential energy. So first, what you want to do is, in general, in the ocean, you have water sitting above um, some sort of ground. So any water parcel is going to have some sort of potential energy. But that not all of that potential energy can really be used or converted into any sort of useful kinetic energy. So first, you want to subtract out this term called the background potential energy, which is obtained um, by resorting fluid parcels by stacking them from the bottom uh, in increasing order of density. And so for a given density b, you can find this uh, parameter z star of b. And this is shown here. So you basically have this curve of what the density distribution looks like in its minimum potential energy state. And then you have the background potential energy, which is kind of like calculating regular potential energy but using z star. And you have available potential energy, which is the total potential energy minus the background potential energy. So this is the energy in the ocean, the potential energy in the ocean that's actually useful. And why do I focus on the Southern Ocean? So first, you have this differential heating and cooling. Um, you know, you have a lot of more cooling here than you would have at, uh, closer to mid-latitudes. But on top of that, you have really strong zonal winds, um, the westerlies and the easterlies, that continue to circulate around the globe. And I recently have visited uh, Punta Arenas, which is right on the Magellan Strait. And they basically have ropes in the city so because the winds are so strong so that people can hold on and walk around the city. So the winds in the Southern Ocean and that this region are, in general, very, very incredibly strong. So it's a good place to study the um, combination of wind and um, buoyancy forcing. Uh, so for my problem, I used a direct numerical simulation code uh, that solves Navier-Stokes equations, uh, non-hydrostatic, with uh, Buzinesk approximation and rotation. So all the Buzinesk approximation does is it basically assumes that the density fluctuations are so small that you can use this reduced density or buoyancy parameter, uh, B, instead of the full density. And um, I put rotation as this external forcing term. And I used 
the software called uh, SOMAR, Stratified Ocean Model with Adaptive Mesh Refinement, and uh, further details on that can be found in Sintili and Scotty. I only put in the forcing and um, the boundary conditions. I did not develop the code myself. Uh, so this is the uh, setup. I have several runs. I have the control case where I only have buoyancy forcing, and then I apply to this basic case different types of wind forcings. So I have this box kind of domain. Uh, it's periodic in X direction, so to simulate that zonal channel. And uh, I have uh, walls on this side and this side uh, on the bottom. And I have free slip conditions on the top. And on top of that, I have this Dirichlet buoyancy or density distribution. So you have denser fluid here and lighter fluid over here. So this is to simulate the dense water formation. And my domain is, uh, so it's x, 5, uh, 10, and y, and 1, and z. And I have rotation that corresponds to the southern hemisphere rotation rate. And then on top of that, I have uh, a few scenarios with different wind forcings, and such that I impose the wind so it's recreating easterlies in the lower part of the domain and then westerlies in the upper part of the domain. Uh, and I didn't just pull out my four things out of the hat. I actually um, looked at ECHO, which um, is an MIT GCM model that matches actual observations of surface forcings in the ocean. So I matched my density profile as close as I could. So the blue is uh, the ECHO, and then green is what I obtained from my simulation. Uh, so my Dirichlet boundary conditions are fairly well matching to what's actually going on in the ocean. And then I have several different types of the wind profiles. So the, um, these dots indicate what is happening in the actual ocean. And then I have um, this really weak case, so labeled uh, WF1. Uh, WF2 is this slightly stronger wind case, but not quite as strong. And then I have this WF3, which is the fit to all these little dots. And in this, work, in this presentation, I will only focus on uh, WF1 and WF2, because those are the ones that I have run so far. Um, so why is it important to look at direct numerical simulations, and especially why am I using blue waters? Uh, in general, the large-scale ocean models do not resolve mixing. Uh, this is a picture from MIT GCM ECHO2 ocean state estimate model. It has about 18 by 18 kilometer re resolution, and it's a full 3D model. What they do is they uh, match the surface forcings and everything to actual um, observations in the ocean, and then try and go back and you know, fix the, all the turbulent parameters. But it still only resolves up to um, mesoscale eddies. And so really, the turbulence occurs at centimeter to millimeter scale. So you really cannot be resolving um, actual turbulence from these kind of models, even though it looks like it still has a lot of going on. And so irreversible mixing can only be computed as a residual instead of directly, versus if you use direct, direct numerical simulations, you can actually compute the mixing directly. Um, however, uh, the DNS models do have their drawbacks. It's difficult to mimic realistic ocean. So in the ocean, you have really large aspect ratios. Um, and uh, you also have really high Raleigh numbers, uh, which depend on viscosity and horizontal scales. Um, and this is obviously really difficult to replicate in DNS, and my model does not do that. However, the computational capabilities on blue waters allow to push the envelope so I can have fine enough resolution to actually uh, be using DNS. And also, it allows me to have long uh, runtime. And in general, this is a big drawback for DNS, is that you have to take really small steps due to high velocities that result from uh, the wind and the rotation rate. And on top of that, you also uh, need many time steps required to reach steady state on top of that. So um, it takes, each run takes any time between one to three months. Uh, so this is a picture of, uh, this is a video of one of the simulations developing. So I, um, you can see all these beautiful eddies and turbulence starting to develop. The green is denser water, the purple is um, lighter water. 
and this is just going through from my um, beginning of the simulation to the steady state, uh, or quasi -state, steady state since you can't really have full steady state with turbulence. And this is a snapshot of what is going on roughly about um, quarter of the depth under the surface. And this is just comparing how you can use Z star because of that really sharp profile that Z star has. You can really uh, identify strikingly which regions are denser and which regions aren't. So and the red here are high Z star values, so a lot denser regions, and then blue are um, lower dense regions. Uh, in order to compare my three simulations, I uh, did several plots first, just to look at how, for example, the circulation is altered by introducing wind. So when you only have buoyancy forcing, you have these two cells, and this has maybe a third one developing, but this has been fairly well observed in most of the horizontal convection models. Then once you introduce even weak wind, it really changes the circulation pattern drastically. So you end up with these five rotating cells, you know, four and then a lot of things going on in the middle where you have um, convergence of the wind. And then once you introduce even stronger wind, you are going to have even more cells. So the circulation pattern is going to be drastically different and very much more complex from the buoyancy forcing only case. And this is not even looking at the realistic wind forcing that is going on in the ocean. This is way um, smaller. This is about um, half of the realistic wind forcing in the ocean. This is about 10% um, of the realistic wind forcing in the ocean. Um, and going back to the vertical buoyancy flux in the ocean, so this is a plot from my previous work that I uh, did working with the MIT GCM. And um, what we found is that the vertical buoyancy flux, you have this offsetting uh, negative and positive regions in the southern ocean, so this is a zonal plot. Uh, this is latitude and this is depth. And then the turbulent component is largely negative, but what you actually look at the ocean energy cycle, you have uh, basically a balance between the vertical buoyancy flux um, in the ocean. So what that means is that the kinetic energy cycle and the available potential energy cycle are largely decoupled. And that was one of our findings based on uh, MIT GCM, and we were wondering how that affects uh, what happens when you change the wind in the ocean and um, in our DNS. And so th these are the same plots as this, just for different simulations. So you have the mean and the turbulent buoyancy flux. This is the buoyancy forcing only simulation, weak wind and a little stronger wind. And what I have found is that as you introduce wind, you're basically getting to a point where um, you are getting more, mostly negative turbulent buoyancy flux, which is approaching what is, I have found in the uh, GCM models. And just looking by numbers, uh, you can see that you have, as you introduce wind, you're creating a lot more balance between the mean and the uh, vertical buoyancy fluxes. And what that means for the whole energy cycle is that you have more balance here. And what that means is that uh, a lot more, a lot greater proportion of the AP generated at the surface is going into this irreversible mixing. And why is that important uh, on a global scale is that for me to recreate this entire energy cycle and to calculate how much irreversible mixing I have, I have to run these DNS models, I have to do um, you know, a lot of 3D analysis, you have to be really mindful of what the depth profiles are, how well resolved not only are you horizontally, but only also vertically. Versus the AP generation, you can calculate just from the surface values. So that can be obtained basically from any satellite measurements. And so if we can equate that, uh, however, AP gener is generated at the surface is directly related to how much irreversible mixing is being generated, then uh, this process becomes a lot simpler and you can basically gauge how much mixing is going on way simpler. Um, so in conclusions, um, first, if you have um, even weak wind stress shifts the energy cycle, you have a lot more balance between mean and turbulent vertical flux. And on top of that, you have 
greater portion of the surface AP generation contributing to the irre irreversible mixing. And this is still, we need to see how that changes as you uh, introduce even more wind stress. And so the future work is I'm working on a run where um, I'm introducing rough bottom topography, which is something that's missing from my current run. And I'm also changing the wind stress profiles to match the relative strengths of the easterly. So I'm currently running this um, WF3 profile. Uh, so it closely matches this line. And on top of that, I'm also running, uh, I'm planning to run another run which matches the east strength of the easterlies but doubles the strength of the westerlies, which is something that certain papers uh, in climate change have found that might be a result of the climate change. And um, we would like to know how that will impact as the westerly strengthen, how that would impact um, the mixing in the ocean. And since I have maybe one or two minutes, I'll just show snapshots of my rough bottom run. This is not at all run to the end yet, but so this is the flat bottom run and this is the um, rough bottom run at the same time. And you can't, I mean, the buoyancy field you see looks a little more mixed, but the striking difference is in this um, velocity in the y direction. So the red is water flowing to the right and then um, blue is water flowing to the left. So you see that you have a lot more um, energy dissipation for when you introduce rough bottom topography. And there are a lot of DNS runs that don't, which you know, makes sense because you have a lot of more breaking and, um, and I think that a lot of DNS runs don't really, are not very mindful of uh, introducing rough bottom. So the GCM runs do, but the DNS runs tend to just have this really flat bottom topography for most of them. So it'd be interesting to see how that changes um, the energy cycle. <laughs>